Amen. We finally have the date set for the revival. It'll be the first Sunday. I think that's November the 6th, but whatever the first Sunday is. And we're going to go through Wednesday night, and then we'll see. Hopefully we'll go for a month. It would be nice to have one of those old revivals. You have 70, 80 people come to know Christ the Savior. That'd be something, wouldn't it? Praise the Lord. Anyhow, so uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, open your Bibles with me, if you would, this evening, please, to Proverbs chapter 20. And uh, we'll start in uh, verse 8. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 8. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right, 20, 21, 21, eight. yes, start, you'll start in chapter 21, verse 8, not 20, I was looking at the top of my Bible, I knew mean, that didn't sound right, I was thinking, why is it saying 20, but previous chapter, okay, so, we'll jump right into it, the way of man is forward and strange, that's certainly true when mankind is left to themselves, in fact, you probably walked away from people and said, man, that guy's strange. <laughs> They're just kind of different to weird. Well, sin has done that to people. But as for the pure, his work is right. So you see way and work are contrasted out of the way of a man that's, I'm saying, left to himself is, is crooked, strange. But those that are pure, clean in their heart, his work is right. Now, I want to stop here and just say something about that word way. I know I've mentioned it several times because the word way is used at least 75 times in the book of Proverbs. And you say, well, that doesn't seem that important. Wait, wait a second. It's used another 600 sometimes in the Bible. And it means most of the time, or a good part of the time, it means which way, which way to Gilbert, which way to Jaeger. You know, it means a direction. But in the book of Proverbs... Solomon's using way as a motive. What is your way? What is your, your, your motive, your, your heart, your work, your, your thoughts? Spiritual. Spiritually, what is your way? There's a way that seems right to man. It leads to death and destruction. There's a way of God that leads to everlasting life. So, so he's saying here, a, a man that's left to himself, his way, his thoughts, his Hard, his work will be crooked. But then when God directs it, it'll be a pure way, a pure work, you know. Then you have to choose for yourself. You know, I, you, I can't choose for you. And uh, you can't choose for your children. You want to. We'll talk with some about that and train up a child in the way they should go. Again, one of those uh, 75 times that's mentioned in, the, in the, at least 75 times. I got tired of counting, so it may be a few more, but at least 75 times in the book of Proverbs, that is, means your motive, your thoughts, your spirituality. Verse 9. It is better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. In a, in a, in a, in a beautiful, wide, luxurious house. You'd be better off, because we started out a few chapters ago, remember, uh, it was the word nagging there, contentious, is is like a dripping. And it'll, Solomon will say that. I guess if you got seven her wives, it comes up a lot. So it's going to come up again in a few more chapters. Uh, it's just a continual dripping. Now, that's irritating, you know, like Chinese water torture or something. But also, it's destructive because a house has a leak in it, will eventually rot stuff away, especially with dirt that have the same kind of structure we have with two befores and things, they had this uh, topped roof with branches and then clay on top, so it would eventually rot. So it's being destructive. But let's skip on over to verse 19, okay? It is better to dwell in the wilderness <laughs> than with a contentious and an angry woman. <laughs> All right, so, so he started out in the house and it was dripping, dripping. He moves to the housetop. He still can't get away from her. So he moves. Now don't think of wilderness like behind your house, the woods. This wilderness is the Judean wilderness. It's desert. It's freezing cold all night and burning hot all day. 
He's going past the farms, past the sheep herds, past civilization. He is out in the wilderness. And he said, it's better. This is the wisest man that ever lived said this. Of course, he wasn't too wise. He had seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines. But anyhow, it's better to dwell in the wilderness. The top of the house ain't going to help you anymore. You have to get all the way to the wilderness to get away from this contentious and angry woman. Now, I'm not going to tattle on anybody, but one of the guys whose wife was gone uh, this weekend said, I think the church ought to pay for him to go to California next week. Tony. But I'm not, I'm not saying anybody's name out loud. You know. We're wailing. He was saying that, you know, at least send Britain and, and Sherry. So, but uh, he was joking, Britain. He loves you. Yes, sir. <laughs> but guys, the, this is still, I, I, I'm kidding about it. It's just a serious matter to think about. Men can be this way too. Don't nag each other. Don't be contentious with each other because that's not how marriages should work. You know, uh, we need to communicate in the right ways. The number one leading cause of divorce in the United States for the last 60 years, so we're not talking about something maybe it's the last few years, since the 1960s has been finances, okay? I, I, I didn't think it would. But number two is lack of communication. I would have thought that would have been the first one since I don't pay the bills and stuff. I don't never even, I mean, I'm never full with that, written checks and stuff like that. But I would have thought finances would have been number two, you know, but no, finance is number one. But think, the second leading cause for divorce is people nagging at each other, just a lack of communication. So it's important for us to not be contentious, let's look at some of the words, brawling, nagging, or contentious in verse 19. So, if you want any kind of marital bliss, it's going to take cooperation. And, and Solomon is, you know, said some pretty outlandish things here. The dripping, drives him to the roof. Now he's driven all the way to the wilderness, you know. So, all right. The soul of the wicked desireth evil. Now you think of it. I highlighted that word, my desire. The soul of the wicked, that's their passion. They want wit, they want evil. Not bad, they want evilness. Evilness. They want evil in their life. The soul of the wicked desires evil. So his neighbor findeth no favor in his eyes. How could you get along with someone like that? So, you know, there's some people you can't get along with. If you've got a neighbor like that, then you try to do the best you can. But it says there, his neighbor findeth no favor in his eyes. When the scorner is punished, scorner, remember, every time... In Proverbs, mean rebellious person, someone that's rebelling against God. They're not following God with their whole way, their whole heart. When a scorner is punished, the simple is made wise. So you see somebody getting beat with rods. You know, uh, there are, there are countries and the American citizens have found this out. For instance, in the Philippines, if you're caught littering, they beat you with canes. They beat you. Well, you know what? Even American citizens, because we, we're not protected from them. You know what? Don't throw trash down. Mm -hmm. If you're driven around McDowell County or Mingo County, mm -hmm. I can't all together say I wouldn't mind to see some of that done. Mm -hmm. You know, quit throwing your trash out. Quit being so goofy, you know. So, so. But if you beat them, <laughs> it makes even the simple-minded, even the, the, the slow in their head is made wise. And when the wise is instructed, he receives knowledge. I like that because hopefully that's what's going on here tonight. Wise people here are being instructed in wise ways. The book of Proverbs. By the way, this is our 15th study. 14 weeks we've come all the way up through the uh, beginning of chapter 21. So it's our 15th study. I hope we're being made wiser. When the wise is instructed, he'd have to be beaten. He receives knowledge. The righteous man considereth, gives thought to, looks at this. The house of the wicked, their, the place of the wicked, the house, not just their building, their house, but their household. The righteous man wisely considers, that's ETH in the King James. This is what's, one thing I really love about the King James, even though it's not my favorite translation, it is the one that I use when I'm preaching and teaching. 
is when you see that ETH of the King James, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, always it's, it's, a, it's a verb or participle that means continuing to do. So that's nice. You know, when Jesus said, keep on knocking, keep on asking, he, he asking, knocking. Okay, so, so this is here now. He is, if you consider this a wise person, the house of the wicked, but God overthrows the wicked for their wickedness. So we consider the wicked, but God is the one that judges them. I want to go back to Psalm 73 again, not that to the detail I did a few weeks ago, but Asaph said, my feet are well and I slipped. I was ready to give up. Why do the wicked prosper? Why don't they have any pain in their death? And then he said, then I went to the house of the Lord. And when he got God's word, he said, I understood their end. Guys, the end is what counts. I'm not saying the journey is not important. The journey is important. But the end is eternity. So we want to make sure our end is correct. So you know, so the house of the wicked, the house of the wicked is is is, is destroyed, overthrown by God Himself. Here's a good one. Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but I shall not be heard. If you stop your ears, there's two different words for cry there. And I want to point that out. And other translations kind of did point that out a little better. But Whosoever stoppeth continually stopping up yours at the cry, that is the pleading, the outcry is the word, outcry of the poor, there'll come a time that he will cry. This just means call out. It's not as desperate. But he will not be heard. And that means heard of who? Of God, of course. Now, I do want you to notice this. He that stoppeth his ears to the cry of the poor does not say to the cry of the slug. I really want to keep stressing this. All throughout the book of Proverbs and Psalms, we are not instructed to assist the sluggard. People that refuse to work, people that are too lazy to do, we'll run into them again in just a few minutes in, this, in, this, in the Bible study this evening. So don't feel sorry about that. But those that are poor, guys, do you think you're better than they are? You're not. You're not better than they are. And I say they because... You say, well, I'm poor. No, 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 no. I saw what you pulled in, okay? I mean, you got air-conditioned cars. You got heat at home. You got nice clothes to wear. You're not the poor, okay? But when you close your, close your ears to the cry of the poor, God does not please with that. Remember, he is their redeemer also. He made them. They are God's image bearers. Huh. All men shall know you're my disciples because of the love you have one for another. That's important stuff. A gift given in secret pacifieth anger, and a reward in the bosom, strong wrath. Now, I think this is a matter of motive because if you check five commentaries, you'll get three one way to another. Check ten, you get five and five. Some say this is not talking about a bribe. Now, I think it is, okay, but there's some consciousness. This is a reward. Uh, a gift, uh, the, uh, I mean, a, a gift given in secret pacifies anger. They said, well, you know, if you give a gift to someone, don't make a big deal about it. It satisfies your anger. I, I get that, okay? And going beyond that, a reward in the bosom, given again in secret, even does away with strong wrath. Now, that's one way to look at this verse, okay? So, if someone's very upset at you, don't try to make a big show of yourself. Don't show off. But you can take a gift and give to them, and that's kind of an apology. I'm bringing you a cake. You know, I'm bringing you something nice for you, okay? I don't think that's what it's saying, but there's half the commentaries do. I think it's actually still saying, it's talking about bribes. A bribe that's given in secret pacifies anger but I guess I've now made a little note here then you're not smart enough to figure this out so it's just a matter of motive are you giving it to bribe someone that's bad if you're giving it to say all right, I'll give you a good example husbands this is for husbands here tonight have you ever stopped and got flowers or something for your wife because you were a jerk the day before 
Now, you know, if you can buy the little $5 flowers, you know, and you know, they, uh, but if you go to the florist and get baby's breath and all that other stuff decorated around, she'll set it out on the table for a week and say, Daniel's a jerk. But look, at least he's trying, you know, so, so you know, at least he's a jerk that's trying or something, you know, so, so anyhow, so it's, it's a matter of motive. Are you doing it to bribe someone? If you do it to bribe your wife, that's definitely wrong, okay? It is a joy, it is joy to the just to do judgment. Or another way to translate that is, and yours may be translated this way, it is a joy to the just when justice comes, when justice is done to people. So, but it's a good, say the same thing. It's a joy to the just to do judgment, or when they even see judgment coming. But destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. I think Solomon could not be more clear in the book of Proverbs. <clears throat> Doing wrong leads to God's judgment. I mean, that is some of the best wisdom you'll ever get in your life. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding, that's if he's made a choice, he didn't accidentally go that way, he wanders out of the way of understanding, shall remain in the congregation of the dead. That's a permanent thing. Shall remain. The English gives you a good strong sense. The Hebrew gives you strong this is not escaping. You can make choices right now where you wander. Okay? But if you're not careful in the end, there'll be no escape. You can't say, well, I, I'll make things right when I get to hell. It doesn't work like that. As long as there's breath, there's hope. I really believe that. You know, that there's hope that people can be convicted of their sins and make things right with God. But there comes a point that there's an end and there's no choice left. He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. Well, what's saying is, if you're not planning for the future, if right now everything's got to be immediate gratification, they love oil and wine. They've got to have it right now. No thinking about, well, let's wait till I can earn that. Wait till I can do this later. No thinking ahead. So it's a poor man spiritually and, 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 and physically. Do you remember another verse of scripture? It says, the love of money. Right. Money's not the root of all evil, is it? Uh, it's the love of The oil and wine is not, the, is not what is, is, is bringing this, this person to nothing, to <coughs> not be rich. It's the love of the oil and wine that's causing that. That means prosperity, uh, pleasures, you know. It says this, Solomon just gives good advice. You, you'll be poor. Verse, he that loveth pleasure shall be a, a poor man. And he that loveth one and all shall not be rich. You know, they want that instant gratification. The wicked shall be ransomed for the righteous. And the transgressor for the upright. Almost every commentary will say something about Haman in this verse. So I'm going to too. You remember the story of Haman? One of the really cool stories of the Bible. There's this guy. He's a like Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Treasury. He's a he's a big. He's one of the secretaries in the Persian government. And Artaxerxes really likes this guy. So he's like you know, in charge of stuff, you know. So, uh, but he hates this Jewish guy named Mordecai because Mordecai won't bow down to him. Everybody else is brag. Oh, there's the great Haman, but Mordecai never bows down to him. It ticks him off. He gets invited, Haman does, to go to a party with the king and one of the queens, Esther, name of the book. Just he is invited. Wow. And that very day he says to his family, I can't enjoy anything because I'm still so mad at Mordecai. I'm invited to the king. I still can't enjoy anything. They said, won't you build a gallows 75 foot high and we'll hang old Mordecai there tomorrow. Good idea. Now he's feeling better. Feeling all spry. So he goes to see the king early in the morning. Well, here's God. This, you know, if you're watching the movie, this is also going on at the same time. The king can't sleep that night. But instead of having music played to him, which they would do because rich people could do that, uh, he had the official records read to him. That ought to put you to sleep. You shouldn't read the government <laughs> diary. So, and he's reading it and place it. Happened to come open to? No. He, 
it's opened up and reads to him about Mordecai exposed, exposing a plot where people were trying to kill the king. And the king said, what did we do for this guy? They said, nothing was ever done for him. He said, thank you. He said, oh, okay. So the next day, Haman shows up early in the morning because he wanted to get the Mordecai killed. And before he could ask the king for anything, the king says, what should happen to a man that the king delights in? Well, he thinks it's him, of course, because he's cocky and stupid. And so I think he should be put on a horse and led, uh, one of the king's horses, and led through the streets and proclaimed what a great man he is. And the king said, that's a great idea. You are the best. You're the best, Haman. Go get this Mordecai. Put him on the horse. I'll let you lead the horse. <laughs> and so he leads, he leads Mordecai through town. Great is Mordecai. <laughs> All right. So later in the day, he goes to the party. Just the king and queen are there. Well, there's some other stuff leading up to all this, but I'm not getting into all that. What's happened months before this, he's going to try to kill all the Jews and had the king sign some stuff. So Esther says, I'm a Jew. Finally revealed that the king didn't know his wife was a Jew. And uh, so he says, well, what I've written, I've written. We'll try to figure something out. And uh, she said, well, I remember Haman talked you into it. So his day just went from best day of his life going to a party with the king to lead Mordecai through town later that afternoon he's at the king. Well, the king leaves all trying to figure stuff out. Haman leaves over on the queen's bed, begging her for mercy. He comes back and says, Will you rape my wife also in front of me? And one of his guards said, There's a gallows he built 75 foot high last night. Of course, he didn't build it. He was so wealthy, people worked all night to build it. And the king said, Let's hang him on it. <laughs> Don't you love that story? Mordecai gets to ride through town. The bad guy gets hung, and eventually God saves all the uh, you know the Jews. Okay, but anyhow, so the wicked shall be ransomed, shall be the pay for the righteous, and transgressor for the upright. All right, we read this. It's better to dwell in the wilderness. That still cracks me up. Than with a contentious and an angry woman. There is a treasure to be desired, and oil and oil in the dwelling of the wise. Now, verse seventeen said. If you love oil and wine, you'll, you'll not be rich. But he says here, there is a treasure to be desired. You know, just like the verse 10, those wicked so desired evil. But the righteous wants a good, good things to go. There's a treasure to be desired, and oil in the dwelling of the wise. Huh. But a foolish man spendeth it up. I think about, it's, every time I... Here's something, one of the verses in Proverbs like this. I always, Brother Ray, think about people like that were, were heavyweight champions of the world or, uh, or baseball or sports uh, athletes that got paid not what you used to think of me. And I remember the first baseball player, because this didn't happen until the 1980s, the first baseball player got a million dollars, first pitcher, the Jack Armstrong, the million dollar arm. Now you can go four and six and st- and get five million dollars. I mean, you know, so, but, and then, but they waste everything. And you hear about them working a construction job or something years later. What happened to all those millions? Well, I guarantee you, you make it. Somebody's got their hand out to take it. That's just how it is. That's, well, that's what Solomon said here. So be wise. And you can have oil. You can, you know, God will bless you. He that falleth after righteousness and mercy findeth life. Righteousness and honor. Wow. If you are following after, your, that's your desire, is righteousness and mercy. Mercy means, uh, let's say I looked it up, kindness and loyalty. You, you're not just going to get that. You're going to find life, righteousness, and honor. You're looking for God's blessing. He's going to give you more blessings than you ever dreamed of. That's what God does. God's like that. He's going to give you life. The, the first one there. Find it the life. The word life there in the Hebrew is Flowing waters, it implies a flowing waters. Strengthen your spirit and your soul. You'll, 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 you'll be refreshed with God. <coughs> wow, I hope that's us. I hope that's us. We're looking for righteousness and mercy, and then along the way we'll find life, righteousness, and honor. A wise man scaleth the city of the mighty. That's, that means a wise man has skill, because it takes a lot of skill to scale a city wall. A wise man has skill. And cast down the strength and confidence thereof, the false confidence of the of the mighty, so called mighty, the strong men. 
you know. So uh, there's another verse in the New Testament. I can't remember exactly what it says. I know it's in one of the Corinthians that says that our prayers, our life is uh, spiritual strongholds pulling down. Y'all remember that verse? Uh, to the pulling down of strongholds. To the pulling down of strongholds. So, so if we set our mind to, to doing the right thing, we'll be able to cast down this false confidence of the mighty so-called. Whoso keepeth his mouth and tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. I wrote one word here. Amen. <laughs> Ain't that true? I heard Brother Johnny Hunt say this. Probably the first or second of the men's conferences we went to. He was talking about saying something to his wife. As soon as he said it, he said, Oh! He said, I ain't fast enough to run across the room and catch it. <laughs> Once it comes out, it's gone. Now, the guys, that's true. Whether it's to a friend or to your wife, to your husband. If you just, because here's what it says in the book of James the tongue is set on fire of hell. Power of the tongue is set on fire of hell. So, amen, amen, brother. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue will keep his soul out of trouble. Proud and haughty scorner is his name, who dealeth in proud wrath. All right, so his name is haughty scorner, and what's, he, what's his business? Proud wrath. That's, his, that's what he deals in. Proud and haughty scorner is his name, who dealeth in proud wrath. Wrath. So if your business is to have proud wrath, your name will be considered a scorner. You'll be one of the rebellious ones. The desire of these two verses go together. The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. He coveteth greedy all the day long, but the righteous, on the other hand, giveth and spareth not. The righteous have extra. God somehow blesses them. You know, think about the children of Israel traveling for 38 years in the wilderness, 40 years counting the time they come out of Egypt and two years they spent at Sinai and their clothes never wore out. Their shoes didn't wear out. God just somehow blesses. Have you not found that to be amazing in your own life? Mm -hmm. Right now you may say, well, finances are pretty good for me. Think back to the day they weren't. Think back to the day they weren't. And God just somehow blessed and blessed and blessed. You say, well, I don't understand this, but hey, you know, uh, I was so nice when we, they, they had a flat, Cheryl and Debbie, and I think who else was with you, Darlene and Wanda, and uh, on the way back, and so we, they check it out, and it's the tire is just completely, I mean, Mike, you looked at it, it's just, how in the world they even, good thing they didn't happen on the interstate, just blown out, you know. Now, we only had tw less than 20,000 miles on those tires. And uh, we was able to buy two new tires and a front end alignment and oh, all wheel alignment on that car and, and some other little things done to the, to the vehicle today. Debbie was saying, you remember the day, Daniel, we used to go up on top of the mountain and buy retread tires? I said, I do remember the days. I mean, you know, we couldn't afford used tires because that cost more than retread tires. But we'd go up on the mountain where these old boys didn't make their own retread tires up there on top of the Buffalo Mountain. And, uh, you know, what a blessing they were, you know. So God does stuff. He blesses you. You think you can't find a way? God makes a way. But the desire, the passion of the slothful kills him because he refuses to work. He coveteth. He desires. He wants something all day long. But he just won't work for it. Well, he shouldn't have it then. That's what the Word of God says. He just shouldn't have it if he won't, he's not willing to work for it. But if you're willing to go out and work, and, and there's a there's a group and I'm going to put it in an advertisement for them right now called the Tug Valley Friendship Association, and they give thousands of dollars in gifts to children in in Mingo County and I think some in Wyoming County every year. It's what well, some in Pike County, and here's the rule: they don't give to anybody on public assistance. If you're the working poor, they take care of your family. And I think what a great ideal. What a great ideal. If you're working, you're trying, and you just can't seem to get over the hump, a, a sickness hits and you're living payday to payday, and now the house is in trouble. What a, I love this group. What a great group. And if you're looking for a good charity to give to, the Tug Valley Friendship Association. And they, get, they work with people that work. 
And I think, wow, what a novel idea to work, help people that actually work for a living, the working poor. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. Worship is in view. It's talking about worship. They go to worship God. They bring a sacrifice, but their heart is wicked. God says it's an abomination to be a hypocrite. How much more, even if you, when he bringeth it with a wicked mind, it's one thing to be a hypocrite. It's other than to say, I'm buying God off. I'll take him a little lamb. I'll be, live as wicked as I want. I'll do whatever I want. I'll just go take a lamb and buy the man upstairs off. God says that's all. It's an abomination. Abomination <coughs> to God. So I, I wrote down a, a few people here that, that, that we don't want to be like. The last note I have is this. Don't be like this group of people. Don't be like this people, okay? There's Hophni and Phineas, two of the priests. Eli was their dad. Eli was a great man of God. Hophni and Phineas were accepting the sacrifice of them, but they were having sex with women at the tent, tabernacle. Then there's the original high priest, Aaron, the man of God, the man of God, God's man. I mean, the one throw the rod down and the Ate the serpents, uh, the rods of of, of the Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's magicians, but his two sons involved what sounds in the King James at least they got a little alcohol in them, and they offer up a strange fire. They go right into the tabernacle, which has just been built, it's brand new, and God sends fire out of the altar and burns them up. He said you'll only offer the fire that God tells you to offer. You think you're better because you're the high priest's sons, because you're priest yourself. Then the New Testament, there's Ananias and Sapphira. Remember what they did? They lied to God. They lied to God. Yes, we sold. They wanted a big name in the church. We sold this piece of land. We're giving it all. And Peter said, is that really all? Yeah. Now, God didn't tell them to, they had to give any. It's completely on their own free will. They could have sold it and give half of it. But the, what a brag and lie. So, never remember the story. Drop dead. So they bury him. She comes in. She drops dead. You know, for lying and God just so don't be with these people. Do not be with these people because all of these sacrifices were pointing to the Lamb of God, our sacrifice, Jesus Christ, and all of it was supposed to be respected. A false witness shall perish, but a man that heareth speaketh constantly. A false witness shall perish. So God is not pleased when people go around lying. Remember, seven things, he's already told us, seven things God hates. Lying's on the list twice. Also, it made the big ten, right? Thou shalt not lie. False witness shall perish, but a man that heareth and speaketh uh, uh, constantly. Okay, so, so we are to listen, have our ears open, pay attention to what is being said. A wicked man hardeneth his face. But as for the upright, he directs his way. Here's that way again. A wicked man hardens his face. Huh. Huh. <clears throat> Sign of defiance. Look up this way. I'll try to maybe illustrate this for you. You've talked with people. And really, they harden their face. They don't want to hear what you have to say. Guys, you're wasting your time. A wicked man hardens his face. He's defiant. His attitude is terrible. But on the other hand, this is a contrasting proverb, the upright, he directs, he, God directs his way. There is no wisdom nor understanding, nor counsel, three things, no wisdom, understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. He is a sovereign God. And I know I say that, and you may say, I'm sick of hearing that, Daniel. I don't think we can set it up. Our God is God. Okay. He is sovereign. He is the creator of this world. No, we, we are his children in the sense that we've been bought by the blood of Jesus, adopted into the family, born again. Christ calls it. But let me tell you what. We are not God. We are trying to be God-like. We're trying to be more like him, to be better people. But listen, he is, he is the sovereign God. And we will never throughout all eternity be tired of praising him. To see the facet of uh, what's called, the manifold glory of God, to see the, the different facets of God will never go tired of His beauty, praising His holy name. And then people say, well, I don't know if you could trust the Bible. They've been translated so many times, and you talk about different translations, Daniel, and, uh, well, let me tell you what, guys. 
You think God give us an inspired book and he wasn't smart enough to take care of it, make sure we get a translation in German and in English and in Latin and I don't know, the hundreds of languages in the world? Of course he is. The God's word is God's word and you can trust the translation. If, it, if it's a translation, don't trust paraphrases. They're fun to read, but if you've got a translation, you can trust this right here. It's what God's word says. No wisdom can go against him, no understanding, no counsel. You remember Balaam in the Old Testament in Numbers what, like chapter 22 to chapter like 25? Balaam is this guy that has great spiritual insight. And he says, so Balak, the king, sends him to come and curse Moses and these children of Israel. He says, I can't do it. They're God's children. Well, they come back with more money. So it wasn't a matter. His was just he did he, the price wasn't high enough. So he says, I'll go with you. And remember one of the cool stories in the Bible. The donkey starts talking to him on the way. You know, and he's, oh, if you had a sword, I'd kill you. And I'm thinking, how stupid are you? It's a talking donkey. Come on, man. That's bound to be worth some money. But anyhow, so uh, he sees the angel of God. So he go, the angel says, you go, but you make sure you do what God says. And when he goes there, he still plans on cursing the children of Israel. But what's it say here? No counsel against the Lord. He opens his mouth and says, How beautiful is the camp of Israel. How holy is their God. And the king says, I ain't paying you for this. And he goes, said, Well, let's go to another side of the mountain. It'll be better over there. So they offer some more sacrifices. And this time he says, he starts prophesying about the coming star of God, the Savior, Jesus Christ. So, yeah, you can't counsel against God. You're fighting a losing battle. <clears throat> In fact, it goes on to say this, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Just ask Pharaoh and his horses and chariots at the bottom of the Red Sea. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. We'll take a break right after this. Take time for questions and comments for a minute. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And loving favor rather than silver and gold. A good name. It doesn't mean a, a good name like Balsafar or something like that. It means a good name is your reputation. A reputation, a good reputation is worth more than great riches. It really is. And love in favor of men, the influence that you have with men, is better than silver and gold. In fact, I made some notes here about this. It's First Timothy chapter 2. He gives the instructions about who can be deacons and pastors in the church. One thing he says is they must be blameless. That doesn't mean sinless. <laughs> we wouldn't have no deacons or pastors in the world, okay? It means nothing. It's literally the Greek word that means nothing sticks to them because they're clean. Nothing sticks to them. Yeah, you can accuse them. And in fact, in verse 7 it says, they have a good report of men. You know, people will defend you. Somebody come to me and say, oh, Brother Danny, when he used to run that gas station, he cheated people all the time. I'd say, no. I uh, know. I just don't believe. I don't believe that's true. That's not. That's just not true. Well, you know, brother Mike, he's just not a good guy, you know. And uh, no, I don't believe that. Mike's got one of the purest hearts of anybody I've ever known. You just look, guys. If you have a good reputation, ask brother David. Uh, it's better than silver and gold. It's better than anything for people to know. Now, I'm not talking about exalting your deacons or pastors or anything like that, because all of us have feet of clay. But what a thing we all want to look forward to the day that we can say that he has a good name. You say, well, I didn't have a good name. I used to do this. I used to do that. We all have the Eustas in our past. That's why we had to be born again. But from this day forward, you can have a good name. You can say, hey, people used to say I did this, and I did. But now I don't. I'm blameless. I want to have a good reputation. I want to have a good name among people, you know. All right, let's take time for some questions or comments about these first, what, 17, 18 verses here. I'll give you another chance in a little bit, okay? You'll be thinking. The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is a maker of them all. Hallelujah. On this side of eternity... There's a large gap between rich and poor. I realize 
you got to understand, our nation is so weird. Most of the world in all of, church, in all of history has never known anything like a middle class where there's people that have more than enough food to eat every day. Their needs are taken care of. This is an American thing, okay? And it's now spread to other nations because of this great experiment that our forefathers had. You have people that work. We can make a living. You can take people, hey, nobody in the family went to college, and all of a sudden you'll find all four children went to college, you know. Somebody's trying to do something. You know, you so, so. But, guys, most of the world's not like that. There's a big description between the rich and the poor. And you know what, guys? In the end, at the gates of eternity, how I, maybe Charles Spurgeon said that's where I got it from, I think. At the gates of eternity, we will all look at the same sovereign God. I like that. We'll all be. If not, I won't take credit for it. If, if Spurgeon didn't say it. At the gates of eternity, God, the Lord is a maker of us all. A prudent man actually foresees continually, E-T-H, the evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. That's just pretty self-explanatory. The, the prudent person has an ideal, a perception of what's going on around him about evil and <laughs> hides himself away from it. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, I've got probably about, maybe not more than 10 or 15, I just really think they're my verses I love, is what Job says. He said, I'd set in my mind not to look at a maid. What a thing to say. I'm not going to look at her and say, because Job, you understand, when you have, when you're the richest man in the world, women no doubt would want to throw themselves at him. And he said, I have made my mind. I will not look at a maid. He was faithful to his wife. He didn't even look that way. And guys, that's a, that's a good attitude to have. So he, he hid himself from adultery. You can't go around and say, oh, I'll just look, 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 window shopping. I hear preachers saying that. That's all right, the window. No, it's not. That's stupid. If you continue down that path, your heart will be led astray because the mind is always made a convert of the heart. The heart's always the one that ends up being in charge. So just keep your heart clean. Hide yourself from it. But stupid people, the simple, they go on and they're punished. By humility and fear of the Lord, are riches and honor and life. I made one little note at the bottom of my Bible. I hope that's true in my life and your life. I hope that my life and your life is all about the fear of the Lord. And then God will take care of the rest. Jesus said, if you seek first the kingdom of heaven, come on. And all these all these other things, all these things will be added to you, you know. Thorns and snares are in the way of the forward. Actually, you know that's grace. God could just let the the the, the forward means the crooked, the crooked in heart. You could just have God could just have them a highway, then it's take them straight to hell. But God doesn't do that. He puts thorns in the way, he puts snares in the way, traps in the way, because he doesn't want people to go to hell. This is God's grace to slow down the sinner, to make them think, to consider their ways. He doth keep his soul. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Stay away from the snares and the frowardness. So, but it's God's grace that does that. Now, maybe one of the best known verses in the book of Proverbs, maybe in the whole Bible, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, only Betty and Jeremy have little kids here tonight, okay? They're the, so I'm going to talk to them a little bit, but I'm saying, you got grandchildren, you got great nieces and nephews, you got, you got children in your life that you can be influential over. It's more to the parents, but it's also to teachers, to grandparents, okay? People, okay? So train up a child. Now, every other time, every other time in the Bible that this word train up is used, it's the word dedicate. No other time in the King James is translated anything but dedicate, 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 dedicate. It's uh, Hanukkah. Uh, like the Jews every year have a feast of Hanukkah. It's a feast of dedication. Now, I'm not going to explain that you can look up online what it is, okay? But it's, it's a feast to celebrate the dedication, the rededication of the, the temple. Uh, so anyhow, guys, so, so it's Hanak. Dedicate your child. Here it is again, the way the bent, not, not the way they want to go, but the way that God wants it, the way he should go, 
God's way and trust God. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Okay, so let me talk about this a little bit. Train up, <coughs> dedicate, Hanak. People grow one way or another. Trees, I've noticed one of the trees in my yard, it started out being almost straight up, but now where I planted it, the sun comes up this behind it and draw it's drawing a certain way. Okay, you, you'd see that if you if you notice flowers and things, you know. So so we need to be in their children in the right way. Toward God's things. Bend them toward the right way, that way again, the, the thoughts, the heart. And let me say this to especially to Betty and Jeremy. They're not yours. God only loaned them to you guys. God loaned them to you. They're, they belong to God. And so you keep that in mind. It makes it a little easier to do the right thing. Because you, God loaned you. And, and all of us that have grown children, now we know that. Of course, they never quit being your child. They're still your child if they're 40, 50 years old. It doesn't matter. still your child. You still love them. You still want to dedicate them, guide them in the right way. But especially easier to guide when they're still being bent. You, they're more flexible, so you guide them as, as they go. So guide them in the right way. God loaned them to you, so bend them the way. Now, I'm not saying you have to change their personality. That's not what I'm saying. Every child is different. Don't say, why can't you be like your sister? If you had a sister like me growing up. <laughs> I mean, she never got a whip. Now, Darlene, y'all know Darlene. The young, I never heard of a baby in the family getting more whips. Than she got more than I did. She was the meanest kid in the world. But my sister Joy Marie always shined that halo up, you know, always shine. Why can't you be out in the first grade? Why can't you be like your sister? Second grade, I went to another teacher that she, Joy didn't have. She, Thank you. Okay. Why can't you be? Well, listen, then one of them one time said to me, why can't you be like your cousin? I'm not going to say the last name in case they ever watch this. And I'm thinking, if you knew what my cousin did, you'd never say you want me to be like him because he ain't no good. But anyhow. But, so I'm not talking about you have to beat their personality out of them. I'm just saying, dedicate them to the Lord. And yes, they've got their own personalities. But bend them the way God wants them bent, okay? Do that, okay? And it cannot start too early. Uh, let me tell you, I told you what the Hebrew word here, Hanak is, it's dedicate. But other Arab, uh, Middle Eastern people use the word Hanak too. But when I use the word hanak, it's mouth. Okay? So it's a, it's a, the, when a baby is born, and, and our hospitals still do something like this, not exactly this, of course. They would chew up a date or figs or something that's very sweet, and then put a little taste of it on their finger so the child learns to suck because you don't know how to suck when you're first born, evidently, and most, a lot of people don't. So they, of course, hospitals, we still do stuff like that. We teach them how. To, so it's, at the beginning of the way, Hanak, dedicate. At the beginning of the way, give them a hunger for what's right. Create a hunger inside of them for the good things. Now, I'm going to say this. It, it, this is a promise, but it's also directive. You say, well, I brought my kids to Sunday school. They're going to heaven. That's not what it says. No, 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 no. It's a directive to you to do this, okay? Bring them up the right way. Do your best. To, to get them in God's Word, not just that God's Word is the Bible, but God's Word is your answer, son. Let's look in the Bible, see what the Bible says. I don't know about like some nut job, but saying, let them know that God's Word, what is being said in, in Christian churches, is, is the way, the way again, okay? So, but it is saying this. doesn't mean every child will be saved, guarantee them heaven. But if you teach them, if you hanok, you dedicate them, you create a hunger in them for God, it does mean that they are very likely. It's, it, here's, oh, uh, Debbie said not to say this, but I'm going to tell you what the Hebrew word for old is, okay? <laughs> and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The old means, make sure I give it, when your chin hangs down. <laughs> That's funny. My mom always made a picture like this after she turned 50. <laughs> my mom, my mom always had that hand under her chin, you know. So, and when Sarah says to Abraham, "I'm old," or says to the angels, "I can't have a child," which said, "My chin's hanging down, I can't have a child." So every time you see this word that's used dozens and dozens and dozens of times in the Old Testament, it just gives give you a little chuckle when you keep that in mind. 
whether it's talking about men or women, it's when your chin hangs down. <laughs> I don't want to get in no more trouble, so I'm going to go right on from there, okay? The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Don't believe them when they tell you it's credit cards. They're debt cards. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. They're giving you credit. Oh, look at David God. Give you some credit. Check mark, check mark. No, no, no. You put yourself in debt. So, guys, a big, I told you the number one reason for divorce in our nation for the last 60 years has been finances. I know it's much easier for older people than it is younger people. I do understand that. For one thing, when you reach a certain age, you're probably reaching more of your maximum income you'll earn your profession. Also, by then, hopefully you've got maybe at a certain age you have your home paid for. You Things like that, you know what I'm saying? But even when you're young, try to avoid debt as much as possible. Don't just say, I've got to have this. Remember, he that loves oil and wine will be poor. That's what it says. You're not going to be rich. So, so get out of debt as much as possible. I, I think that's good advice. That's what he's telling us here. The rich will rule over the poor. The borrow is servant to the lender. So I realize that debt is impossible not to have, okay? You uh, buy an automobile, you're probably going to have to go in debt for it. Not always, but probably you are going to have to go in debt for it. If you buy a home, it's very unusual that you wouldn't go in debt for it. But make sure that you do the best that you can. I, my nephew just bought a home, very big, really big home up in, in uh, what's it called? Crown and Hollow or something like that. It's a really nice area uh, up in uh, Ackerville, up in up in the real nice area of Buffalo Creek. Big home. And I said, you know, Alan, if you'll pay this off, if you'll pay, if you're paying, man, I think he said like $1,100 a month or something like that. I said, if you'll pay another 10% of that, you know you'll pay your home off in 17 years instead of 30. You'll save yourself thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. I didn't know that. First house me and Debbie bought. A deacon in a Baptist church told me, Tom, uh, what's Tom's name? Yeah, he, he tells me, he brings me his office, said, uh, you're buying a house? I said, yeah. He said, listen, what's your house payment back then? A lot of different house payments didn't enough. $500 a month, pay $50 more a month, and you'll pay your house off 13, 12 to 13 years faster. He did the math because he loved math. He showed me, even on a house that many years ago, I would have saved $29,000 by paying fifty dollars more a month, guys, try to be out of debt. What he's trying to say? Just try not to. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. You'll fail. The rod of your anger shall fail. Uh, there's two ways of translating this. So let me see if I can find. It. it should say you'll fail. You'll come to a bad end, but also says you'd be another way. In some translations, translate you'll be destroyed by your own rod of anger. But there's this rule of sowing and reaping. I'm not going to go into big detail because y'all know the three rules, don't you? You know, you always get what you sow. If you can't plant peppers, expect to get cucumbers. It doesn't work that way. So if you sow kindness, you'll reap kindness. If you sow love, you'll reap. If you sow hatefulness and wickedness and filth, that's what you reap. Second, you always reap after you sow. This is the hard part, isn't it? We want, hey, I've sowed something good. I want to see a result faster. But we got to wait for God's season. Got to wait. I'm hoping we're going to have a season of revival in November. I'm hoping God's going to let us reap something that we've been sowing here in this area for years. So, and then at the end, you reap more than you sow. If you sow the world uh, wind, you'll reap the whirlwind. If you sow, Jesus said, "Come on into the joys of your reward. You've been faithful over little bitty things. I'll make you ruler over many. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed." For he giveth of his bread to the poor. Wow, if you have a good heart. Because for he giveth his bread to the poor. Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. The strife and reproach shall cease. Cast out the scorner. That's going to be part of Sunday morning's message from uh, Romans. When he says, uh, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division offenses, contrary to the doctrine of, that you have not learned. And avoid them. So Paul said the same thing that he said. Let's say, cast them off. We start to love people. But don't be a part of that. Cast them out. And contention will go with them. Hmm. If you are one of the people that's always causing trouble, don't be surprised if trouble comes your way. 
you know. So if you have a critical spirit, you know, say, well, nobody's good in that church. Well, you know why? Because the church is made up of humans, <laughs> all of us, you know. I love that story, and I, I, I'm evidently not going to go as far as I thought, Jeremy. But, but I've got to tell you this story. Jesus tells this story. says, there is this guy that's having a great big party for his son, a wedding party. And he, so he sends out the invitation to all the rich folk, and they all make excuses. I can't come. I can't come. He says, well, go to the halt, the lame, the, the uh, misfits, and fill up my house. And that's what I like to say. He says, welcome to the misfit place, <laughs> You know, we got low standards here. That's why you're allowed to come. <laughs> you know, that's why I'm allowed to be pastor. But because God said, hey, look at you. You're the blind, the halt, the lame. But he bought us with his blood and made us something very precious, Sister John. He took us that were nothing. And bought us in his blood and made us his bride. So cast out the ones that want to tear that up. He that loveth pureness of heart, uh, of heart, for his grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. You can make friends if you just the opposite of verse 10. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, but he and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. What time is it, guys? 8.03. 03. It was the last verse then. The slothful man says, There is a line without. I shall be slain in the streets. Now that's one of the best excuses ever. <laughs> I can't go to work because a lion might eat me. I can't uh, take care of that around the house because I heard there's alligators in the in the Tug River. You know, I mean, just that's ridiculous. I can't go because there is a uh, hurricane coming through. Yeah, but you live in Iowa. You can't be afraid of the hurricane in, in Florida. You stupid thing. I mean, and then I know this is not true. At least I don't think that is true. But it's a really good story. And it might be true. People, I've heard preachers preach it for years. It's true. It's hard for me to believe that it is true, though. But it's still a good story. That in the, one of the wildfires in California, they was this man. You may have heard this or read down the line that there's this man in scuba gear that was burned to death on top of a tree in one of the wildfires. And they started checking into it, found out who he was, and called his family. Well, he called into work that day. I took sick to go to work, boss. <coughs> You know, so he went scuba diving, and you know how those they come and swoop up all that water. Well, supposedly he got scooped up with the water and dropped out in the middle of a forest fire with scuba gear. Now I've heard preachers preach that for years and tell that's true. I don't know if it's true or not, so don't say that I think it's true. But it is a cool story, just as cool as there's a lion in the street, there's an alligator in the yard. Now, that could be true if you live in Florida, you know. But you know what, guys. What it's saying is slothful people just don't want to work. They have no intention of working. And so uh, be careful of them. All right, so that's not too bad. I thought we'd get to verse 16, so we're just a little off. Let's take time uh, after we dismiss to, to take time for questions and comments. Heavenly Father, we do love you. We praise you for all your blessings that you pour out upon us. What a good and mighty God that you are. Help us, Lord God, to take this and apply it to our hearts that we could be wiser people. Bless our upcoming revival. Give us many souls for the labor. Bless the work of the church, Lord God. Let's do things that are pleasing to you. Bless our Sunday school time Sunday morning that our minds will be filled with your word and our hearts will have a desire, a desire for your way. In Jesus' name, amen.